So he might have had clothes of camel's hair for nighttime when it was cold because it gets real cold in the desert. In the daytime, you're not going to be wearing that camel's hair. It's way too hot. So let's go on. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. So all he had was this girdle of skin about his loins. And God's very specific on that. So John preached in a girdle of skin about his loins. Do you think he wore his camel's hair and then baptized people every time it got that all wet? It would take a long time to dry, right? And it'd be really heavy after it's wet. He's not gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna take that, 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 that camel's clothing off. He's not gonna go in the water with his clothes like pastors do today. He took that camel's hair off. He's not gonna get it all wet and then have to dry it out before he can put it on. But it's gonna be really cold at night if it's wet too. How's it gonna keep him warm? So all he did was baptize people in the loins cloth. He wore his camel hair, he would freeze at night in the wilderness as it would take too long to cry possibly. What do you think? I think that's possible. I don't know what. What he wore, I, I would say honestly that um, he would probably stay, have to stay modest. It was definitely a lot of Okay, whatever. <laughs> no, he didn't have to ask him. No. Well, you know, it's funny. When when God found Adam and Eve, I don't only I think. Yeah, you need to carry that same standard over to the same hotels. So, you know, when God found Adam and Eve, they just had on an apron. You know, just that area was, was covered. But you know what God did? He made them coats. You know, he covered He covered all that, man and woman. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. you're, you're riding around half naked on your lawnmower, sir. Get right with God and put a shirt on. I agree with that. Up the show, up the show. And yet, if you go in, in, w with a bathing suit or something to, 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 to a beach, your pastor's going to get really angry with you, saying, Oh, you're naked, you're naked. Barnabas and Paul ran around naked and acts. Brother, I just, I'm not sure what the affinity was. <laughs> naked, bad, clothes, good. Yeah. Like if Paul and Barnabas were you know, running around and they're all men's river make it that's their business but but you keep, keep, keep your clothes on okay yeah keep your clothes on number one <laughs> keep your clothes <laughs> on number two don't take your clothes off no it was number one don't take your clothes off number two keep your yeah clothes that off. was the tony uh i almost said my message. tony hudson message yeah two different tones there you don't understand the scriptures what scriptures we're reading a scripture right all John wore was a loins cloth. A loins cloth, that's right. Oh yeah, and you know that most pastors and churches won't go to a beach to preach? Oh, the people are naked, we can't go there, we're sinning. What? Who's going to reach those? The God said to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are those people not creatures on the beach? We're to preach the gospel to them. Get away from these pastors that are lying to you. Get away from them. So John was very, very humble. John was very humble. These pastors today in their fancy business suits and some of them six, seven thousand US, US dollar suits, they need to humble themselves. Get out of those suits. What are they doing in there? Standing at the front above you, above the laity. <coughs> it's a Jezebel spirit, I'm telling you. So John was very, very humble. Not like these greedy, haughty pastors today. And monkey suit preachers. See, we ought to imitate John's example. You know, you want to you want to be a good preacher, a good pastor. Imitate John's example. And John was clothed with camel's, camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey and preach, saying, 
There cometh one mightier than me, the latchet of whom shoes, shoes, shoes. I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Hey, let's go to John 3.30 now. John, the book of John. I hope you have a King James Bible when you're doing the study. You're going to miss a lot if you don't. You're going to miss a lot. Of course you can compare. John 3.30. John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. So what am I doing? making myself all haughty with these fancy expensive clothes when I preach. I'm not going to be doing that. I'm not going to be putting on no $600, $6,000 suit to preach, making myself all high and haughty. We must decrease. He must increase. Yes, we're to put the focus on him, not us. All the pastors are putting the focus on them. And you're going to see that in, in the little clip of Sam Gipp there that I put up. Notice that toward the end he said... Uh, he said, oh, and the reason I keep going to church is, is that man when I was saved, he was wearing a fancy suit, and uh, that really impressed me. Think Sam, is, is Sam Gibb even saved? Is that his testimony of salvation? That he kept going to going to church because the guy had a suit and tie on? Give me a break. Come on, we're not that we're not that stupid, right? I indeed have baptized with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So John clearly told us here there is no more water baptism with Jesus Christ, it's the Holy Ghost. So these pastors that tell you, oh, you have to be watered baptized in obedience to Jesus Christ they're lying to you sorry give me the scripture and verse and give me the witness give me the witness that we're to be doing that today as New Testament uh, uh, Bible believers now grandpa had verse 9 to 13 circled here so I'm just gonna read it maybe there's something there for us and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descended upon him. Now what did that just say? The spirit like a dove descended upon him. Does it say a dove descended upon him? Like a dove. The spirit like a dove. So the Holy Ghost is like a dove. Yeah, but it's not a dove. And all these Baptist church buildings and church buildings all over the world are using this dove as, a, as, 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 as an idol. Yeah, they got an idol. They got, always got a picture of a dove or, or some sort of icon or idol in their church. building of a dove. The scripture doesn't say that. It says like a dove. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So here verse 11, this is where according to the people that take the son of God out of Mark 1.1 1, 1, that he gets saved. So Jesus actually wasn't the son of God until verse 11 according to your new Bible versions. Do you want to believe a Bible that Jesus didn't become the Son of God until Mark 1, 11? Mark 1, 1, he wasn't the Son of God left. Matthew, who wasn't the Son of God yet. You see, you see where this is going? It's turning, it's like you be, can become a God too by getting water baptized. That's why the pastors are water baptizing you. So you can become a God, or like a God, or a little God. Yeah, be real careful of that. Be real careful of that teaching. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So when you get saved, you should get water dunked right away, or should you go in the wilderness? Hey, if we're to be Christ-like, Jesus went straight into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he was tempted of the devil. Verse 12, yeah. Verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him. So you see all these uh, uh, movie depictions of what happened and Jesus fasted 40 days and he got tempted of, of, of Satan? No. It's, it's, scripture is very clear here. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan. So he's tempted in Satan of Satan during those 40 days. Not, not 
at the end or just at the end. He was tempted to Satan during the 40 days when he had nothing to eat. Maybe, maybe, does it say he had nothing to drink? I have to go to those scriptures. But maybe he had nothing to drink. <clears throat> but anyway, he had nothing to eat for the 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan was tempting him that if, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones uh, into bread. Yeah. <clears throat> but Jesus never turned the stones into bread. And the modern music industry is teaching you, point, pumping into your heart, that Jesus did t turn those stones into bread. Oh, my church is such and such. No, we're the church. We already went through all that. We're the church. Well, I go to a church building. I attend church. It makes you no, attending church makes you no more of a Christian than a dog or a bird. No more of a Christian than a dog. But I'm a Christian. I, I go to church. So the, the text for God's word came out of Antioch as well. When all new Bible versions came from the Vaticanus, Rome, and Sinaiticus. This text right here came out of Antioch. This came out of Syria. And uh, by the way, the Sinaiticus was the, the, the discarded text from a garbage heap at the false Mount Sinai in Egypt. We know Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. It's over in Arabia. It's also very interesting that the source of the new Bibles, using the Codex Sinaiticus, which would be the NASB, the NIV, the, the uh, New Standard Version, uh, all, all, uh, English Standard Version, they're all missing the words, certain words and verses. And actually, I challenged a pastor at, uh, at uh, your guys' school, the name of it, I forget the name of that church there. But uh, I challenged a pastor on that. And what about all the missing words? He says, oh, the King James Bible added them. I've got a copy of the original Codex Sinaiticus. And you can see that the words got smudged out. A guy told Tissendorf. He smudged them all out. Took them out. And he wrote new sheets. You can see, you can see the parchments that were written on. And they're all faded, 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 really old text. And he's got all these new parchments in between. And, and, and whole, whole paragraphs missing. So he, he's written stuff on new paper back in the 1800s. So these, these new Bible versions are corrupt and out of the way. These pastors and scholars say that they, we, they have the oldest and best manuscripts in the new Bibles. They came from the oldest and best manuscripts. That's a lie too. I can prove that this book was forged in the 1800s. And they're claiming it was from the 3rd century. This Codex Sinaiticus. I can prove that. I got a copy one. So these pastors are just lying. Uh, so what did God say about these translators? And those that ignorantly choose to follow them? That's right. You're in a church building and you keep listening to the pastor and you're not letting the Holy Ghost lead you to this book, the truth. You're ignorant. God says you're ignorant. Let me show you that. Malachi 2.8. Malachi 2.8. That's the last book before uh, the New Testament. Last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. Malachi. I think we pronounce it Malachi in English. Malachi 2, 8. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble by the law. What's the law? This is the law. Yet have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And then we go to Romans 3, 12. We'll get a witness scripture for that. Romans 3, 12. They are all gone out of the way. Romans 3.12 And it's talking about people that say they're believers, that say they're Christians that aren't. And you notice uh, God says he's going to spew these people out of his mouth. And also uh, a lot of people will say, Lord, Lord, but I've done all these things. I went to church on Sunday. I did this, I did that. I even witnessed to people. I did this, did that. He's going to say, I never knew you. I cast you in a hellfire. And look at Romans 3.12. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. They're doing it in vain. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have I ever saved anybody? Never. To my knowledge. Pass out a lot of tracts. Give a lot of people the truth. Only God knows if you saved some. And all these pastors are saying, Oh yeah, we had uh, six confessions today. Six people saved. And these guys, Ron Hart, Reinhard Bonnke, and all these other, other big names, they go to Africa and they say, oh, we had 2,500 confessions signed, or we had 2,500 registration cards signed.
So 2,500,000 got saved. They're lying through their teeth. Those men don't save anybody. Hebrews 5.2. We've got to get one last witness here. Hebrews 5.2. Because I said, God says we're, the, those people are ignorant. I didn't say it. God said it. Hebrews 5.2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? You're out of, this is the way. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, right? This is the way. They're out of the way. They got another Jesus. For that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. So Acts 11.27, we'll carry on with Acts. Acts 11.37. Uh, sorry, 1127, 1127, we're in verse 27 now, 26 we read last, 26, 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Oh, there are still prophets, interesting. And here we're in the New Testament, because you don't see much for prophets in the New Testament. And there stood up one of them named Abagus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout the world, the world, wow, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So this prophet was warning that a great dearth was going to hit the whole world, which is famine, pretty much. So that, so at this transition point, there was still a prophet. But now that we have completed the complete word of God, all prophecies are in here. Anyone says they're a prophet is a liar until the time of Jacob's trouble. That's something else. When the, when the true believers are gone. So all prophecies are claimed, contained herein, in his word, pure word. So if anyone tells you today, thus saith the Lord, unless they're reading from this book, they're lying. They're lying. It better be in this book. Uh, 2 Peter 1, let's just look at that. 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. 2 Peter, let's buy the back of the book here. First Peter, second Peter. Peter one nineteen. Is what do we have in our hands? We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. This is our light. This this is our guide. This will get us through the, the, the hard times we may face before, uh, before the Lord returns for us. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. That's going to be the rapture. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The men that wrote, wrote this book were moved by the Holy Ghost. Absolutely. All the other Bibles say, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. They don't even use the word Holy Ghost. And 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So in other words, if someone's explaining what this means, and you can't find that in the scripture, it's a private interpretation. It's a private interpretation. That's why you've got to have the witness scriptures. And these men, all they're doing is privately interpreting scripture these days. In fact, when the pre pastors are out preaching, you'll be lucky if you get one verse. Maybe, maybe four or five in a whole sermon. You'll be really lucky. There's going to be a star of hunger in the, in the land for the word of God real soon. Verse 21. Uh, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Acts 11.29. Let's go to the last couple of verses here. Acts 11.29. Uh, 
is, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto brethren which dwelt in Judea. So, the pastors today will say, well, see, they're giving tithes and offerings. They're giving, so we, you've got to take tithes and offerings from you guys. So we can drive our fancy cars and, and, our, and our nice big houses and everything else. And they'll use this for that. Uh, verse 30. Uh, but notice it said, send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Those were Jews. They're sending help to Jews. And it doesn't say money. You see the word money there? It says nothing about money. But all the pastors will turn that into money on you today. So you should underline that verse and watch, watch for the ones that are using it against you to try and get your money. Verse 30. Which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So how did the money get to the brethren in, Ju in Judea? The Jews? How did the money get to those Jews? From the Jews? Two men carried it. If it was money, I don't think so. And I don't think it was even carrying, but it could have been some money. It could have been. So here, the disciples sent food and water and goods to help the elders in Judea who were going through a great, they're going through a, a great dearth, a drought. They're starving to death. They had no water to drink. What do you think? The money would have done them any good. None at all. So they probably took camels and, and water and, 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 and goods to feed these men. Maybe some clothes. Just as we should be helping out brethren going through any suffering today by sending them relief. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the scriptures, whenever it says to send money or help the poor, it's always the word brethren is there. Word brethren. But notice the relief was going to the brethren, not a church building. There's no church building. It's going to help the brethren. And there's no pastor with a collection plate at the front trying to make you feel guilty. Oh, I want to help the poor. We need to, we need to raise $50,000 to help the poor. Or you must pay 10% or lose your rewards. A lot of pastors are saying that today. If you don't pay 10% plus, you'll lose your rewards in heaven. Just filthy lies are saying to make you feel guilty and give money. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. We'll read it. Now, while he's away with us, and we are being rewarded for our works here on earth, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to which he had done, whether it's good or bad. What? He's not talking about salvation there. The very fact that they got up in the rapture, they're saved people. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Well, what's the bad then? There are five different crowns that are going to be given out. I'm not going to deal with them now. I could. Boy, you need to get my Bible. This is the most powerful Bible. I have the book of Daniel explained the book of Revelation verse by verse. You got the regular, and then you got the explanations. I've got 89 pages of words that are hard to understand. The A to Z index of Bible prophecy. I've got every verse coded, color coded, and then the initials by the side when each one will happen. I studied this, and I wrote this. I love this old book. So let me continue right now with what I was saying. So the bad is losing all your rewards and being ashamed, ashamed for all the years during that thousand year period when we reign on earth because you have no rewards, no crowns, and you could have had them. The sufferer's crown, the runner's crown, the soul winner's crown, you don't have any of them. Do you tithe? No. Then you've robbed from God. You're going to lose rewards. You've robbed me. How in tithes and offerings? You're cursed with a curse. Fortunately, you don't lose salvation. Amen. Right. You got that forever. But you lose for the bad. And when you disobey God and you don't tithe 10% and give extra, he says, you have stolen from me. Oh, you know, I need funds. Please, I'm not trying to preach this right now. I've got to get this message to the whole world. It's going to cost me millions. I've trusted God and he's going to...
boy. And if you want to be saved, you want to be a Christian, oh, I want to go to heaven. So what do you do? You send 10% plus to these guys. Don't do it. Also notice the relief was carried by trusted men. That's right, trusted men. Directly to the elders here. So that pastor up there is lying to you. He's not a trusted man. Don't give him your money. By the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And money was not mentioned, absolutely. So Father God, thank you for this teaching again today. And, and, uh, and thank you for also uh, getting vaccines in there. That was, uh, hopefully we're blessed by that. Fortunately, we, uh, uh, we don't have to uh, infect ourselves. We, you've shown us ways around that. And just uh, thank you for your pure, perfect words that warn us against these things. Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire.